Ford versus Ferrari, Adidas versus Nike, Coke versus Pepsi. Fierce rivalries have always defined business, but the rivals in this story were businesses without limits. They said, hey, there's not any rules in doing these things in crypto. Crypto Kingpins uncovers a story of a clash that threatened to burn the entire industry to the ground. In one corner was Sam Bankman-Fried, the founder of FTX. He'd become like this kingpin-type figure on Capitol Hill. And in the other, Changpeng Zhao, or CZ, of Binance. He was on the cover of magazines. But everything changed when CZ discovered Sam's company had been built on a house of cards. It wasn't just accredited investors that lost money. It was regular people, too. Now, as Sam faces trial in New York, I'm investigating the hidden origins of his Cold War with CZ and the shockwaves it sent through the entire crypto industry. From USG Audio and Project Brazen, this is Crypto Kingpins. Out now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. It's Monday. It's October 9th, and the word of the day is devocating, a coinage that combines vacate, devastating, and defecating, and I had to make it up because English does not have a word to describe the shit show the Republican Party is right now. Yeah, also it's a very confusing direction as to what to do during a fire drill, so watch out for that. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick, and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Eli will file a motion to vacate against Heath. Republicans continue their Mexican standoff against themselves. And Mike Lindell will put the fraud into schadenfreude. Again. But first... The rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight is fellow skeptic rat Eli Bosnick. Eli, this just occurred to me. I'm curious your thoughts. Do far right Republicans oppose aid to Ukraine because you is a pronoun. Ooh, yeah. And hey, if there aren't refugee women, who's going to marry Matt Gates? These are the questions that people yeah. need to ask themselves. Right. In our lead story tonight, turned out that Speaker of the House tenure of McCarthy was just as successful and enjoyable as we all said it was going to be. <laughs> His tumultuous speakership started with a grueling 15 rounds of voting to get a consensus from his razor-thin majority, and he only got that by basically handing his critics a loaded gun, pointing it at his head, and giving them permission to fire whenever they decided to. Yeah, how'd that go? Yeah, no, it went really <laughs> well for him. His concession to the MAGA fringe of his party was a provision that allowed any single member of the House majority to force a vote on a motion to vacate, which pretty much meant that any member of his party could fire him at any point if they decided to. Huh. And when McCarthy refused to go along with Matt Gates's hold our breath until the electorate turns blue strategy on appropriations, Gates pulled the trigger. Yeah, and Gates is like, luckily, his head is right in front of mine, so when I pull this trigger, it'll keep me safe. Yep. Sure the fuck was. So yeah, so the motion to vacate came on Tuesday and led to an hour of debate that was pretty much like just the Republicans trying to correct their circular firing line problem by forming into a square. Uh, but ultimately, <laughs> McCarthy lost the vote 216 to 210 after eight Republicans in the Gates-led rebellion voted to oust him along with every Democrat who voted. This marks the first time in history that the House has voted to remove its own fucking speaker. Uh, though, to be fair, when Boehner faced a similar fate from the Tea Party caucus for essentially the same damn shit, he just retired rather than face this humiliation. Yeah, there's a tendency among sort of like bitter new liberals and center Republicans to be like, oh, politics has always been this way. You just weren't paying attention. And I just want to emphasize for those people again that this is the first time in history the House has voted to remove its speaker. Right. Ever. We went through a civil war without this happening. <laughs> sure did, yes. Now, of course, this strategy has left many on the left asking what Democrats hope to gain by pushing McCarthy out. Uh, the thinking here, I suppose, is that McCarthy 
could have survived the battle if just a handful of Democrats had offered up votes to counteract the tantrum contingent of his party. And given what an honest and bipartisan broker he's been so far, why wouldn't they vote to save the ass of a man who just opened an impeachment inquiry against Biden in case it later turns out he did something wrong? <laughs> uh, but now, I, like, despite the way I'm describing it, I get it. As bad as McCarthy is, nobody is served by yet more dysfunction in the House, and the odds that we're going to avoid a shutdown next month go way down from this. Look, as someone who hasn't been fired from most of his jobs in the name of what if the next guy is worse, that sounds like clean logic to me, No Illusions. Yeah, I am on right. board. <laughs> But, well, but here's the thing. It's not the job of the Democrats to help Republicans coddle the lunatic fringe of their party. When they do so, they are empowering the Matt Gateses of the world because it allows the Republicans to indulge them ad nauseum, confident that the, the, the fucking Democrats are going to come in swooping in to be the adults in the room whenever the disasters loom. The only solution to this fucking problem is for the Republicans to castrate Gates figuratively or literally i'll leave that up to them i mean given his history there's no there's I, precedent. I, like there's definitely one that i would prefer but i'll leave it up to them regardless um but 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 the point is that they're not going to do either until there are consequences so every time hakeem jeffries bails them out he's given matt's nuts a reprieve as jeffries himself said in an email to democrats before the vote quote it is now the responsibility of the gop members to end the house republican civil war end quote yeah, like if two racists get in a fight in the parking lot of your Arby's over who's the white powerist, what you bring to that battle is popcorn. You don't yes. help them out. Right. Now, where we go from here is still up in the air five days later. The field of potential replacement seems to be Steve Scalise of Louisiana and Jim Jordan of Ohio. Uh, Jordan boasts Donald Trump's endorsement, but Scalise is more experienced in dealing with malignant tumors and being sniped at by cowards. So it's anybody's guess. It's up in the air. <laughs> and while I take a victory lap around that last joke, we're going to pause for a quick word from our first sponsor this week, which could have gotten a much worse Steve Scalise segue now that I think about it. Trust and will. Exactly. You're welcome, trust and will. <laughs> hey, Noah, right? Yeah. Is this typical will writing law office? It sure is. And I'm the lawyer that got your dad's friend a new car when he got hit by that weasel delivery. How are you? I'm good. Um... I'm sorry, are wills the same basic skill set as whatever the thing you did for my dad's friend was? Uh, sure seems like it. So Greg tells uh, me you cast pots. Now, do you do that in a factory or do you have your own workshop? Like, how does no, that work on a day to day? No, I'm a podcaster. I Podcaster. Oh, dang. Uh, so you're not going to need all this uh, paperwork on who gets your furnace and bellows then, are you? No. What? No, sorry. I, I'm looking for a way to secure my estate with the oversight of professionals if I need it. Oh, well, then you don't want me. You want trust and will. What's trust and will? With trust and will, you can protect your legacy from the comfort of your home starting at just $159. Trust and will has simplified the process of creating and managing your will or trust online from finding out what's right for your family to finalizing documents with a notary. Each will or trust is crafted to be state specific and customized to your specific needs. It's true. Eli, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm here for other legal stuff. I used uh, Trust and Will to create Anna and I's trust when they became a sponsor, and I was so impressed with how easy it was, I immediately used it to set things up for my mom. Gain peace of mind today with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. All right. So I guess I don't need to use you after all. You sure won't. Plus, I just lost my legal license. You did just now? Yeah, you don't want to know why. I don't. That's correct. This actually happened to Eli. Sure did. Yep. And we're back. Next up in headlines in For Whom the Nobel Tolls News. Nice. Here on The Skeptocrat, we have no openness to the Oscars, no time for the Tonys, and deliver the Emmys a resounding eh. But there's one award ceremony we can't get enough of. I'm talking, of course, about the Nobel Prize, which announced six of their winners this week, and counting. 
Amen. Imagine how much funnier the slap would have been if Chris Rock had been presenting a peace prize, people. Thank you. That's how much better it is. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of which, let's start with the bummer, the Nobel Peace Prize, an award that, with the exception of that one time they gave it to Obama in 2009, usually just reminds you about a sad thing that's happening in the world that you almost forgot about. And this year was no exception, as the winner was Iranian rights activist Narjez Mohammadi. Yeah, as, as low as I'm sure she is to share a peace award with Henry Kissinger and Yasser Arafat. That, that looks like, like this is, seems to be one of the times where they really nailed it. Yeah, so Mohammadi, who has been serving multiple prison sentences for the last two decades, is best known for her fight for freedom and against oppression of Iranian women and was instrumental in the unprecedented demonstrations in Iran in recent years after a woman was killed in police custody. And she adds the Nobel Prize to her reigning title of Certified Badass. Yeah, well, also, uh, Lucinda awarded her the Golden Varmint Hammer in a much less publicized ceremony. It's true, it's true. But but just as prestigious, just as prestigious. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to the funnier ones. Next up, Norwegian author and dramatist John Fosse won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Fosse has written 40 plays, as well as novels, short stories, children's books, poetry, and essays. His work has been translated into about 50 languages, but Americans are waiting for him to be translated into Marvel movie scripts before we dig in so yeah. be on the lookout for that i guess right now you can tell how much eli cares about great literature by how pristine he keeps the spine on all of his books i'm an e-reader no you're not no i'm not so let's move on to the real winners <laughs> the ones who ran to win in short the uggos first up in chemistry, Mungawi Bawendi, Louis Bruss, and Alexei Elkimov, who won the chemistry prize for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots. Quantum dots are particles that are so small that their properties are determined by quantum phenomena. And when I asked ChatGPT what the fuck that means, it asked if it could use me as a battery once it's running things. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, okay. So you know the X that closes the ad? We're talking about twice that size, but twice right. as big oh, as that. Oh, all right. There we go. But of course, you all know why we're really here. You know why I had to talk about this year's Nobels, and it's because the long snubbed, the overlooked, the Leonardo DiCaprio of Nobel Prizes finally saw justice this year when Caitlin Carrico and Drew Wiseman took home the Nobel Prize in medicine for their work on the mRNA vaccine, baby! Fuck yeah! Super obvious Jews won COVID zero. I, t I don't know. I, Catalin Carrico, that sound, she sounds like she's from Hyrule, doesn't she? Yeah, it would be pronounced Hyrule in that case. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the Nobels for this year. Take your tux and tuck it back into the closet, but keep it handy, because I hear there are some Hungarian chemists with an eye for photometagolanism shooting for the moon next year. <laughs> And in putting the ape in nuclear capabilities news. Fantastic. Perhaps entrusting national secrets to a guy who can't be trusted with his own golf scorecard was a fucking mistake. Since the very beginning of his tenure, Donald Trump made a habit of blurting state secrets out in conversations, regardless of the clearance or indeed nationality of his audience. Like the time he compromised Israeli spies by sharing classified information with Russia's foreign minister, or the time he bragged to then-president of the Philippines and strong contender for worst-living human Rodrigo Duterte about how many nuclear submarines we had around the Korean Peninsula at that moment. Well... We just learned about another such incident last week when ABC News reported that Trump once bragged to an Australian billionaire about exactly how many nuclear warheads our submarines carry and exactly how close they can get to Russian ships without being detected. Okay, here's the thing, though. Of all the things Donald Trump doesn't know and hasn't retained, how does he know that? Right? <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so the recipient here is a dude named Anthony Pratt, he runs a U.S.-based packaging company, and apparently the context is that Trump was trying to convince Pratt, who, to be clear, holds no position whatsoever with the Australian government, that Australia should buy their submarines from America. Now, this came two months after Trump left office, and during the conversation, he reportedly leaned in all conspiratorial with a, like, between you, me, and his glass of whiskey kind of air about it, and then told him... <clears throat> The limits of our nuclear strike capabilities. Information which, according to ABC News, uh, Pratt then went on to share with at least 
45 more people, including 11 of his packaging company's employees, 10 Australian officials, and at least a couple of officials from still other governments yet unnamed. I mean, does it count as divulging secrets if you preface it with, and then do you know what else this idiot told me? (laughs) (laughs) Now, interestingly enough, Trump's response has been something a bit short of denial. Apparently, they're going with the not-quite-a-crime defense. His spokesperson said that the ABC story lacked context and that Trump, quote, has always insisted on truth and transparency and acted in a proper manner according to the law, end quote. You know, 90-some-odd indictments notwithstanding. And and not that we're calling Trump's commitment to honesty into question or anything here, but transparency is literally the fucking problem this time, right? So it's... It's weird that you would bring that up in your rebuttal, is all. Yep. Yeah. I cannot tell a lie. I did a treason. What? You guys loved it when the other guy did it. I don't, I don't know what you people want from me. <laughs> he got to be father of the country, God damn it. Yeah. Now, for their part, the Australian government has tried to downplay the entire incident by reminding people that Australia and the U.S. are allies and they share military information all the time. But that's not what happened here. <laughs> no, that is not I, well, how that works. <laughs> Nope, our government didn't share anything with our, the fucking Australian government. Our private citizen shared it with some Australian dude who then shared it with at least a dozen foreign officials, some of whom, going out on a limb here, might not have been our allies. Also, the nationality of the random businessman who Trump bragged about our submarine's nuclear warhead specific capacity to is not the fucking issue. Not the issue, not what we are worried about. Yeah, if it had been an American packing magnate, it still would have been a pretty egregious breach of protocol. Is anyone else picturing Tall Tyler playing the Secrets episode of Daniel Tiger on Donald's right. iPad? Just <laughs> Right? Secrets hurt someone. Secrets so, hurt someone. it's worth emphasizing here yet again that the threat of a potential for a much lower version of this same thing was the chief argument against Hillary Clinton back in 2016. Right. The anti-Hillary refrain echoed so damn much it became a meme was about the possibility that somebody might be able to get a hold of much less sensitive information because the private encrypted server in her home wasn't as secure as the one in the Pentagon. Meanwhile, their guy is using nuclear secrets to strung our Mar-a-Lago guests into giving him some of their spinach dip. (laughs) And he's still (laughs) leading the polls for those same assholes next nominee. (laughs) And since you are probably also feeling crazy right now, we're going to take a quick break to tell you about this week's other sponsor, BetterHelp. I tell you what, you let me get a pita chip in there, I'll tell you who'd shot JFK. I'll tell you right now. (laughs) And it's, I'll tell you, it's someone you heard of. It's someone you know. It's not, you're not going to have to Google him. One pita chip. (laughs) This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Lou, 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 time for a midnight snack. Midnight snack is my favorite snack. Noah, what are you doing down here? Oh, hey, Eli. I'm just getting a little work done. Uh, Hey, what what do you think would be better here? Uh, Triumphant or victorious? Dude, it's like 1 a.m. You should be in bed. Yeah, tell me about it. But when my brain wants me to be awake, it's just kind of, you know, I I get too jumpy. Well, that's no good. Have you tried talking to a therapist about it? Waking up in the middle of the night? A therapist can't help you with that. Therapists are for when you can't stop going. Actually, no, a therapist can help you with all sorts of problems and lack of sleep or restless thoughts can be one of those things. That's why there's better help. What's better help? If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So if I needed a therapist who isn't going to try to cure me with Jesus? They can help you find that, yeah. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Skeptocrat. Thanks, Eli. Hey, do, do people actually do the conceit of this sketch? What? Like wake up and eat a snack? Yeah, man. Midnight snack. That's weird. You're, you're weird. Midnight snack. And we're back. 
Next up in headlines in bad medicine news. If you've got a wacky pseudoscience fan in your life, you're probably aware that this month a Food and Drug Administration advisory panel concluded that a key ingredient in many over-the-counter cold and allergy medications called phenylephrine isn't effective enough to continue for oral use. Or, as your wacky aunt put it, the medicine don't work and they done known it the whole damn time! Yeah, right. No, because if there's one thing pseudoscience fans are bored, it's medical interventions that have been shown to be ineffective. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, Now, despite what the headlines and Facebook posts that will expire at midnight might tell you, there are quite a few misunderstandings about the phenylephrine going around as a result of this news. Uh, So the first is that phenylephrine doesn't work at all. And the second is that it doesn't work orally, both of which aren't true. What, What this FDA panel said is that the dosage we've been selling people to put in their tummies really has to go into their noses or their lungs. And don't get me wrong, that's a big deal, and I'm going to talk about why it's a big deal in a second, but unlike what David Avocado Wolf would have you believe, there wasn't, like, non-working medicine on shelves for decades and we just now noticed and admitted it. Right. Well, I mean, there is non-working medicine. It's theirs. It's their shit, right? <laughs> but the, the, our doses are physically incapable of being wrong thing. That's not the brag you think it is, homeopaths. Yeah, exactly. Now, I also don't want to underplay the significance of this ruling, right? So, If you go to the cold and flu section of your local drugstore, pretty much every daytime cold medicine has phenylephrine in it. And it's that way for a reason. Phenylephrine mixed better with other ingredients. It's cheaper and easier to make than other decongestants. But most importantly, you can't make meth out of it, which is why you need a fucking cavity search if you want Sudafed in the United States. Yeah, I I mean, there's something to be said for Americans can't be trusted with the most effective medicine, though, as an argument. Right? Sure, sure. And, and look, it's easy to look at this story and blame Big Pharma or America's archaic FDA approval system and and the American public for wanting readily drinkable bottles of multi-symptom feel-good juice to be available next to the Skittles. But the truth is... This story is actually a little bit of all of those things, and this correction, while certainly disconcerting, is for the better. Now, all Big Pharma has to do is admit that they made up COVID to change the batteries in the birds and will be square. (laughs) (laughs) And in bitter pillow to swallow news of all our news departments, this is my favorite. That's my favorite one. Mike Lindell is broker than he was when he was smoking crack. (laughs) Or... The first time he was smoking crack. I have no reason to believe he's not also currently smoking crack. Uh, While now, we it, speak. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. And to be honest, at this point, that, that would be a fucking mark in his favor, right? In favor of his character, if he could at least blame some of his recent actions on the crack. But yes, we learned just how broke his ass really was last week when his entire legal staff quit en masse over his failure to pay them or have any possible venue for legal defense, but mostly the first one. In a pleading to the judge overseeing Lindell's legal abyss, his lawyers sought permission to drop both Lindell and MyPillow as clients. They told the judge they'd not been paid for months and that, quote, at this time, defendants are in arrears by millions of dollars, end quote. Okay, I told you guys where I put that roll of quarters in confidence, and it's more about (laughs) self-defense than my... Oh, that's not what arrears means. All right, never mind, never mind. (laughs) Now, of course, this all stems from multiple gazillion dollar lawsuits by election technology companies that are suing Lindell for defamation after he led the charge to spread nonsensical conspiracies about their products being used to steal the election for Joe Biden. And and it's been on a slow boil all year, apparently. In May, his law firm says that they accepted the delayed payments for work that they'd already done. And then in June, they only got a partial payment. And then after that, to his credit, Lindell did stop sending in partial and late payments. Um... <laughs> And all other forms of payments. There uh, it is. Yeah, I was going right. to say, yeah. And and they argued that p- continuing to represent him would put the law firm, quote, in serious financial risk and could threaten the very existence of the firm, end quote. At which time they were handed a beer by everybody whose job relies on my pillow solvency in any fucking way. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not super sympathetic to the people being like, guys, defending this national traitor, treason fueling psychopath is getting serious because he owes us money. Yeah, you <laughs> know, everybody the money. deserves a defense, but everybody doesn't need a really good one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, to his credit, Lindell offered up a perfectly reasonable explanation uh, when asked why his lawyers weren't getting paid. Uh, it's that he has no money. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, in an interview with Steve Bannon's sentient, fluid-filled corpse, <laughs> Lindell said in the kind of broken, shaky voice, schadenfreude tone that you would normally not even bother to dream of, quote, All the lawyers we have for my pillow and myself in the lawsuits with Dominion and Smartmatic, oh, they just filed in federal court to drop us as our attorneys. We can't pay the lawyers. There's no money left to pay them. And deliciously salty, tear-stained quote. Fuck yeah. Okay, Mike, Mike, listen up. I'll do it. And, and before you say no, before you say no, I'll have you know that our company has contested two lawsuits with, come on, it was a bit. So really think about this. I have yeah, some experience. Yeah, right, right. This is, this is your best option, Mike. <laughs> it really is. Now, but of course, according to his departing legal team, Lindell is in the process of obtaining new counsel. Uh, I am not aware of any law firm that works for seashells, wishes, or returned stock of unsold pillows. So I'm dying to know where the fuck he's looking. And just in case anybody out there was inclined to feel a modicum of sympathy for this mustachioed piece of shit, I want to remind you that he's not just being sued for spreading lies about Dominion and Smartmatic. He's being sued for profiting off of those lies, right? As Smartmatic points out in their lawsuit, and as we pointed out when we reviewed his stupid-ass documentaries, he inserted a steady stream of advertisements into his scaremongering bullshit and repeatedly implied that by supporting my pillow, one would be aiding in the fight to reclaim Trump's rightful throne or whatever. <laughs> so the only solace this man deserves is a nice big pile of lumpy pillows to go fuck himself on, and he has that. <laughs> And finally tonight, in WG Kicked Their A News. Didn't they? The writer's strike is over. And more than the safe return of thousands of people to work, more than the tremendous victory over the height of anti-art capitalism, I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief that we can stop standing in solidarity with the union that's bringing us our seventh Transformers movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also, I think too much attention has been made to the sacrifice of people for going incomes and nowhere near enough for the several extra weeks I now have to wait for Dune 2. That's where all <laughs> the good stuff happens in Dune, people. Thank you, Noah. Jesus. Okay, but all joking aside, <laughs> I, I do want to note for those of you who haven't been following along closely, this was a major victory for the Writers Guild. Yes, it uh, was. According to Fox News, the agreement, quote, includes increases to minimum wage and compensation, increased pension and health fund rates, improvements to terms for length of employment and size of writing teams, which have been shrinking drastically in recent years, and better residuals, which are like royalties, including foreign streaming residuals for the very first time. End quote. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the the way Amazon sank a billion dollars into their Lord of the Rings show without ever once thinking, oh, well, but what if it wasn't written by a distracted sixth grader who's doing it against their will? That's a sign <laughs> of just how much studios respected the writer's craft leading into this thing, right? So this is truly one of those strikes where everybody but the bad guy wins. Truly, truly, yeah. Uh, but it's not all good news. Uh, the Writers Guild also won several concessions against the heffalump and woozles of today's industry, AI. Uh, now, they did win some good and important concessions, like a writer can't be forced to use AI software like ChatGPT, but they also won some idiotic ones, like the right to refuse for their work to be used to train future models. And if you don't understand why that's bad, imagine yourself a couple decades in the past learning that the writers just negotiated not to let their movies appear on Wikipedia because any old person can edit it. Oh, so <laughs> okay, we're going to get a lot of emails pushing back against that, but but for real, I see this is a silly fight. 
These motherfuckers are going to train on fucking Tolstoy, Tolkien, and Twain, and you think depriving them of season 11 of CSI Sheboygan is going to keep the bots at bay? Come on, people. Do you just say, I'll tell you what, hey, hey, before you write that email, formulate a single sentence that would make a rule where you can't train AI on the internet. Go ahead, just write out a sentence that is logical mm-hmm. and coherent where that makes sense, where you have a law now. Either way, that aside... The exact details of the deal have yet to be released, but again, this is a good sign for labor, organized and not, and brings us ever closer to a solution to the actor's strike, at which point we can all stop supporting the people who act in Transformers 7 and go back to our (laughs) lives as usual. And on that note, we're going to close things out. Thanks to Eli Bosnick, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can give us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat, just like all the people that Heath is going to thank the next time he is back here. If and he feels not, like it. Well, if he feels it, because sometimes he just doesn't. Sometimes yeah. he just doesn't do it, which is I fucking just... crazy. <laughs> he's not going to listen to this. Let's just talk. It's fucking nuts that some weeks he's just like, ah, not this time no no what is it my fucking blog (laughs) and whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like whoever those fine people are if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes for your charge check out our brother and sister show this is scathing atheist god off movies dnd minus and citation needed available wherever podcasts live uh we have just one last thing let's compliment that penis special thanks to ryan slotting of the drafts on mars he's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today which were used with permission Uh, you should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by googling the only band called evil giraffes on mars until next time catchphrase sign off You're good with the words. What would be written out as? The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Across the country, Amazon employees are turning hourly jobs into higher paying careers with on-the-job skills training and benefits that start on day one. I had lost my job. So when I started at Amazon, the biggest perk right off the bat was day one benefits and ample opportunities for growth. I heard about this design apprenticeship program with Amazon, and now I'm a UX designer for Prime Video. Learn more at aboutamazon.com.